Hey everyone, my name is Marissa Evangelista. I'm an MFA intern and I will be your moderator for tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with Wood Turner, Joe Dickey. This is a very special Will Talk as this is our 60th Will Talk and we are in MFA's 60th year. And for this talk, we chose a very special MFA artist. Joe has twice served as the president of MFA and has been numerous exhibitions with us. In addition to working with MFA, he is also a founding member of the Chesapeake Woodturners. He became nationally recognized Woodturner in 1984 and has been featured in numerous books and magazines and has work included in museums, private collections as well. Joe's materials range from walnut, willow, pecan, maple, ash, and much more. Additionally, I would like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs in the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between artists and the public. Thank you, Marissa. Mm -hmm. um, also uh, joining us uh, and helping to present the program is Joe's wife, Martha Blackstall, who I think um, most of you, at least those who I see on the screen probably know well, uh, Martha, uh, like Joe, is very active in philanthropic uh, and other community activities. So they're both um, very, very um, valued members of our community, not just the art community, but the community at large. Now, today, as you can see, Joe is in uh, his workshop. And as a woodturner, there is a lot about the individual piece, its materials and the process of creating it that uh, I basically know nothing about. And I'm guessing that most of you who are viewing or listening probably don't know in depth. So unlike many of our talks where I talk about art history and ask a lot of questions that are related to um, the, the background of the artist, I think we need to devote a lot of our time to Joe, hearing Joe explain the materials and the processes as we look at individual objects. And finally, Joe, thank you uh, for agreeing to do this. It is an honor to be able to speak with you uh, in our 60th year uh, of the MFA and uh, our 60th Will Talk. Uh, so it's pretty special for me uh, to be able to talk with you uh, and learn more about uh, your wood turning, which I have to say to you on a personal note, I love your work and I've always wanted one of your bowls, but I love bowls of all materials. And we have so many in the house that my wife said, no more, not even Joe's. <laughs> so anyway, <I> said, <laughs> <laughs> someday I'm gonna work this out, uh, but anyhow. So Joe, uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, Marissa pull up the first image. And Joe, if you, um, before you start to talk about the image, would you just uh, say briefly what you did before you became a woodturner and a um, musician? Well, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if that's pointed to me or not. It's not. Okay, yeah, the, uh, I was trained uh, as a physicist, I have a PhD from, Catholic University in physics. Um, one of my first mistakes in life was to go into physics for the money. And uh, <laughs> when that didn't work out, I thought I'd try art. So here I am as an artist. And uh, when that didn't uh, pan out, it didn't make me rich, I thought I'd go into music. But now <laughs> I've been to go with Shenandoah Run. So I, I'm going to get rich here soon. So I can say it be when I was poor. Uh, but I, with my career in physics, I was with the Navy labs for uh, about 25 or 30 years, and then uh, a decade or so at Johns Hopkins University, where I did some teaching and some research in various fields. Uh, but then, so here I am. Yeah, well, I, I've always admired your um, multi-talented uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's great that you can uh, bridge from the abstract sciences like physics uh, to something as concrete as wood turning. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the collection platter, uh, what it's made of and how you uh, assembled it? Well, uh, 
I'm not really much of one for divine revelation, but but this is a story of that. Um, uh, it actually is a relative of mine by marriage is an Episcopal priest and asked me one time if I would be willing to make a collection platter for his church. And that's when the divine revelation sort of descended on me. And so I said, sure. And I made the one, that, uh, one that's similar to the one that's pictured there. And of course, when he got it, he said, but that won't hold a cent. And then, <laughs> and then he realized what it was all about, you know. And, um, but to his credit, um, some years after that, he, his boss who was a, another retire, retiring priest or bishop or whatever they are, uh, was going to retire. And, and he wanted to get a present for him. So he asked me to make one for them. And then uh, another one called me up from Poughkeepsie, I think it was, and wanted one for their priest. So there's about six or eight of these things around the country in retired Episcopal priests uh, collections. <laughs> That's um, great. Very useful. <laughs> well, I'm not much for putting things in collection plates myself, um, but I think this might this might motivate me to do it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So it's made of two different woods, and it, I, it, I think it's pretty clear where the uh, yeah. walnut is, the black walnut, uh, but is the willow that sort of um, gnarly piece? That yeah, it was a willow burl. Um, burl grow on trees in, in reaction to certain insect infestations, uh, usually very prized wood for wood turning and carving. And how do you manage? First, is sort of getting control of the burl, which burls are very hardwood, right? With uh, odd grains that make it difficult to manipulate, Am I right? Well, yeah, uh, the turning of it's not too bad. When you're turning something like, like what's shown there, it, it takes quite a bit of jigs that you have to build up around it because uh, the rim, for example, is too fragile to turn without support. So you uh -huh. have to build it up with, uh, in my case, two by fours and glue and stuff like that, and, and get it all built up into something that's completely solid. So you turn that and then you take the, uh, the support wood away from it and there you have it. Is there anything that you can show us in the studio that would give an idea of what those supports are like? I'm sort of visualizing it as you explain it. And I think you explained it very clearly, but. I just wonder, you know, if there's something you uh, could. I don't, I don't have one uh, jigged up right now. Okay. But if you can picture uh, an, an odd shaped piece of wood uh, mounted as best you can to a, uh, a circuit or piece of plywood, then you just build up around uh -huh. the interstices of the piece uh, and then glue on the, uh, the piece that becomes a rim uh, and double side tape maybe that to the uh, support pieces so that when you after you turn it you can take that part apart and you were able to turn the, the fragile rim yeah uh, all at the same time it's a little bit about engineering you know, dilemma with the... well that's a good segue to my uh, a question that's been in the back of my mind did your um, scientific career in any way help you? You know, thinking about structures and assembling things and uh, different well, kinds of materials? Perhaps, uh, because a lot of what I do is engineering uh, issues, like supporting the, the rim of that piece. Uh -huh. uh, but some of them, and I don't know if you've got Sefi there or not, do, uh, another slide, I think it's, it's one with two rings in it that are canned at different angles. Anyway. That was one that was sort of inspired by, well, Cephi is a binary star system um, in our, in our uh, galaxy. So, Can you bring that one up, uh, Marissa? She may not know which one it is. No, yeah. but that's no. another one. Keep going there. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, that's Cephi. Um, the Cephi binary star system was kind of the inspiration for that piece. And for that matter, if you back up a little bit, uh, Marissa, there's a one you just passed over. There's also one more there. Um, that one was, um, that's AD, I think 2008. Uh, I figured that's what the earth is gonna look like after global warming. 
Um, and in this case, the inlaid walnut strips, you can see them in there, but uh, they actually hold a piece together. Uh, so that they're more than just decoration. They, they actually keep that piece from flying apart because as you can tell, there's almost two pieces or more. Yeah. But uh, I had a whole series of these. AD 2008 was one, and then there were 2009, 2010, and I worked my way up to 2014, I think it is, before I gave up. <laughs> but but um, I've done a lot. That That's a big piece, by the way. That's about 15 inches, I think, in diameter. Yeah. And, uh, in a collection out in Idaho somewhere. Um, and it's, it's suspended above a pedestal. It doesn't sit on a pedestal. It hangs from a piano wire, basically. So that it moves when the wind blows it. Oh wow! But, but that was inspired by global warming. Yeah, um, I, figuring what the Earth is going to look like in about well, it's about a, eight or a pretty years. harrowing vision of uh, global warming's <laughs> effects. But yeah, uh, yeah, well, it's a little extreme, I admit. Yeah. Uh, I, is 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 the maple? Is that a burl? No, no, that's just a a section of hollowed trunk. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, but but it, it's all together. But then when you start turning it, you take away some of the supporting wood, so that it would have flown apart uh, had uh -huh. it not for the uh, the walnut rings in there. Wow. Oh, okay. All right. And and so that's just natural. Some of the uh, edges of the maple are just what was left behind after. That's right. The yeah. It was a pretty yeah pretty rotten tree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something else that uh, the other piece that we spoke about <laughs> first, I, and I've noticed about your work. Do you consciously seek out flawed pieces of wood because it gives you sort of a, a kind of a spontaneity or another way of approaching, gives you ideas about what you're going to actually, kind of like Michelangelo, seeing the figure within the stone? Yeah, I get, I get a, a similar question a lot. Uh, does the wood tell me what it wants or do I tell the wood what it wants? Uh -huh. uh, and it's sometimes both. I mean, this is clearly the wood telling me what, what should be done with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's all very natural decay and rot. Um, and most people, of course, would just throw that away. It's not even good firewood. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, it, but yeah, so in this case, uh, I, I looked at the piece of wood and, and said, well, you know, I can make a sphere out of that that uh, that shows all the you know death and destruction, if you will. Yes. In the wood, um, but all my wood is what I call roadkill. It's just stuff that um, <laughs> uh, you know. On the side. You, I mean, you'd think wood like this grew on trees, you know. I mean, it's just all over the place. <laughs> well, I remember more than once um, as you were beginning to have to prepare for your move. Uh, and weren't sure whether you would need more wood offering you roadkill wood because I pick it up because I put it in the fireplace. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you have to polish that by hand, the um, the uh, maple portion to get that smooth surface? Yeah, uh, after it's turned, it's, it's uh, sanded on the lathe um, down to 220. And then, uh, then there's a coat of varnish on it. And then I usually buff them. Uh, we say polish, yeah, it's the same idea. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'll show you that in a few minutes, the buffing station. <laughs> um, but it, uh, you buff it with a couple of wheels, one, various grits, and the last one is a, a wax. Mm -hmm. So it uh, brings up a nice, about as bright as you want, the more you buff, the brighter it gets. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of that quality, uh, that's often one of the things that, of course, attracts the eye first about your pieces is, they have these beautiful sense of color and pattern. Uh, so I think we skipped over one of those, didn't we, Marissa? If we go, no? Yeah. There, there it is. Yeah, that's spalting. And um, I do a lot of spalted wood. Spalting is, uh, is German for spoil, for good reason. Um, but those dark lines in there are the uh, sort of the demarcation between where a fungus has chewed the wood up and where it's headed. Um, mm -hmm. So, as the different as the, the rotting process starts in these woods, it worked its way through from various starting points, and you get this maze of lines, dark lines in it. It uh, 
I think quite interesting. Not everybody does, but I think it is. And I'll uh, talk more about that in a few minutes because I, when we do the you know, walk through the shop, you'll see the process involved in that. Well, I think these are especially beautiful. And I part of the reason I uh, I like this form of your work so much is because I, I did know that that's what caused it, but it's that the randomness and the fact that it's nature that's creating the patterns that you then are yeah. uh, aesthetically attuned to and you can bring out. And that leads me to my question. If you can see the pointer, I see the pointers on my screen near the uh, lower edge of the bowl. There's a discoloration of, of light uh, sort of golden brown. It is. Yeah. Uh, well, that's just another form of rock. Oh, okay. Um, but and there's some aniline dye on there also that, that makes them bright yellow. Yeah, that's so, what I was going to ask because you can see over the lip that it's white yeah, on the inside. Right. That's the color of the wood itself inside the bowl. Yeah. And the outside has the the yellow, which really uh, pops the the grain and in this case the spalting lines. Well, that's what I uh, wanted to sort of call attention to because I I don't think that everyone realizes that wood turning is more than just, you know, putting it on the lathe and, and putting your tools to it, that there's a lot that goes into choosing the color and uh, emphasizing the uh, textures and all of that. This, this is just a, a gem, literally, it has a gem-like glow, so, uh, and it's pecan. Yeah, that's pecan, uh, which is kind of a local tree. Yeah. Tends to be for here than here, but with a big, big pecan tree, about 20 inches in diameter. Yeah, my grandfather had a pecan grove uh, in in one of his pastures, so I have uh -huh. a fondness for pecan. Um, all right, let's jump ahead to the next image uh, that we haven't yet seen. Seen this one? Here we go. Self portrait. Now, you, there's got to be a lot to say about this, Joe. Well, there is a story behind this. I won't go into detail, but there was a time in my life when I was um, clobbered <laughs> and very depressed. And uh, and it took some effort to put myself back together. And that's what this piece is, uh, putting putting yourself back together. So the, uh, the inlaid walnut piece holds it together. Um, because again, this piece would probably or likely split apart in the turning oh. process because you can see the crack yeah. uh, in there that goes it goes down through the bottom of it but it also comes up the other side a little bit so oh. that that inlaid walnut does in fact hold it together uh, when you're turning a piece like this that has these flaws these physical uh flaws do you ever just sort of lose the piece of wood because oh, you're you oh, yeah. strike it and it splits apart yeah yeah yeah, you learn where not to stand. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but uh, oftentimes, like in this case, uh, I knew ahead of time that it was you know likely to come apart. Uh -huh. So that's when you either throw the thing away or you take some measures to hold it together, like those bands that are in the other pieces, oh, or okay. in this case, uh, the, the butterfly joint or whatever you want to call it in, in the rim. Yeah. There's a very yeah. subtle gradation in the color of the face of the bowl, which I assume is continuous throughout. Is that yes. the color, natural color of the wood, or have you used any, added anything to uh, oh. create those variations? Oh, no, nothing added. That, uh, that is the, again, it's a spalting, the uh, early stages of rot. But they're stable. And once they're, once they're dry, they're perfectly mm -hmm. stable. That rot doesn't progress without moisture. Yeah, that is the last one, I think. This, yeah. Are there more than one of these, Joe? Are there what? Are there more than one of these? Oh, there's a lot of red ones. Uh, red has been very popular, and I've sold yes. uh, hundreds of them. Um, this particular one is just sort of representative of the, of the genre. Um, and some of them, if it has a particular shape, uh, the title of the piece is Nude in a Red Dress. Uh -huh. uh, Sometimes it has other more descriptive words like Carmen and or femme fatale and things like uh -huh. that. But red is, is a very popular one, particularly for wedding presents and things like that. 
Yeah. But I have to say that I've seen this in a couple of um, silent auctions or uh, there at one of the red ones. And it yeah. is amazing to watch how the bids keep going up until the last moment. So uh, they're, they are a personal favorite. And I think lots of people around Annapolis have been fortunate to get one. What makes you choose the color? Just because you enjoy red or it's a popular color? Or is there anything about the wood, this piece of wood or the other pieces there? In the dye, the blues and green don't do much for the wood. Uh, OK. Uh, so it is connected in some level with the wood itself. Yeah. yeah. OK, so we've looked at all of these beautiful pieces. Uh, and, and we do have um, a good amount of time left, as I'd hoped. So uh, why don't you give us a little walk around the shop uh, and point out some of the uh, key tools uh, and machines that you use to create these beautiful things. Okay. Well, this is the lathe. That's good. Okay, this is the lathe. And I've put a piece on here so that I can actually turn the thing on and uh, show you what happens to it. These are the safety glasses. This is the, the gouge that I do 95% of my work with. I'm going to just for a few seconds here so you can see the process. Keep doing that until you get everything removed that you don't want. And you end up with a piece that's roughed out. Like here's a bunch of them, for example. Uh, and then you wax it uh, or put it in a bag so that it dries slowly. That keeps, it keeps it from cracking oh. and weigh it. And uh, I weigh it every once in a while and as a weight, drops, that means moisture is leaving it. And when the weight stops dropping, it's dry. And that takes months. So these spalted pieces are likely about two years in process. When once you cut the billet or cut the tree, you cut it into billets, the sides to accommodate the bowl you're eventually going to do. And either rough it out and weigh it and let it dry, which is a, uh, at least a year in process, and then you can return it and turn it, do final turning on it and finishing and whatnot. So they're generally about two years in process. Um, I had no idea that uh, it took that long, and I thought that you used uh, sort of like an oven to dry them quickly, but I guess that would cause them to crack if it dried too quickly. Well, yeah. Uh, there are other ways to dry them more quickly than, than this. You can put them through the microwave, for example, but that's hazardous uh, for the microwave and the piece. Um, Where'd you go? But, uh, but it does work. You know, I, if I'm in the gallery, I've had people look at my pieces and, and sort of wrinkle their nose, and then I come along and they ask me, and they, they say kind of, well, how long does it take you to do this? I know what they're after. They want to know why it's so expensive. Yeah. And my answer to them is it takes 35 years and about four hours. <laughs> well, that, that's it. I mean, you know, it, it does take uh, all together. These things are, are several, like four, five, six hours in process, but over the space of a couple of years, but there is 35 years or 40 years of yeah. experience yeah. going into this. Have um, you ever injured yourself with the lathe? No. Um, I've had some of my students <laughs> injure themselves. <laughs> But no, I've, uh, I'm pretty careful. Um, one of the biggest hazards is, is dust. Oh. Uh, and I have ways that, that I take care of dust. We have dust extractors. Put over here to show that. That bag that with the hose on it. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a dust extractor that I yeah. put on when I'm sanding. Yeah, I can't imagine that you could work in there without something like that. I worked one summer in a grinding wheel uh, factory and there was a lot of dust oh, yeah. and, and such like- uh, That's even worse than wood dust. Oh, yeah, you bet. It's yeah. carcinogenic. Uh, yeah. Now the, the 
the sharp instrument that you use to actually uh, remove the wood, aren't there all different shapes and uh, types of those things? Uh, a couple, but but as I said, 95% of my work is done with one tool. Uh, and that's this, this is a, what's called a bowl gouge, but there are other shapes you could use, um, particularly if you're doing spindles, then there's a whole, this is not very good for spindle, but this is good for, for the shapes that I do, the bowl shapes. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So if you wanted to do something that was um, a bowl that had a pattern of ridges and hollows on the outside, you'd use those different tools to help you make it? No? This is it. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I mean, students will ask me invariably, new students, what's the first tool I should buy? And I tell them a 5 8 bowl gouge. And they, they're fine for a while. They go get one and they're turning and then they come back a little later. They're like, what's the next tool I should buy? And I say another 5 8 bowl gouge. <laughs> Because you do 95% of your work with one tool. Well, I wanted to, to show over here. Okay. The num there's a, all these bowls here that you can see are roughed out, weighed, and waiting to be turned. So in a sense, in a sense, you're always uh, kind of like a, a mother hen, if you will. You uh, go in and check on the chicks and see how they're uh, whether they're ready to be let go on their own. Well, I, I really have learned much more than I thought I would because I thought I knew the rudiments and you already uh, told me a number of things that show my lack of understanding. So I hope everybody else has uh, had that experience and your work is certainly beautiful, but there must be questions out there that um, people have about process or about your background or something. So I, um, Marissa, you want to manage that as usual? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I do have a question myself. Joe, how do you come up with your titles? <laughs> uh, well, it can be I, very difficult for some people, I know, but. If, I, if, I, if there's a kernel of wisdom here, is that the title of a piece is very important. And the collection platter, not everybody gets it, but most people do. And it takes them a few seconds to realize what it, what's there which is kind of humorous. Uh, and that has a lot to do with selling me a piece. I have also um, a series of, of these things, which is kind of my chamber pot series. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that, believe it or not, people kind of chuckle at it. <clears throat> I tell them that all my pieces are factory tested before they leave the shop. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, of course, fortunately, they, they don't believe this, but uh, but the title of a piece is very important. Uh, yes. Uh, and I think that's true in, in almost all art. The title is it gives them a hint as to what you're after because a lot of the the messages, if you want to call it that, in art are fairly subtle. Yeah. And very often the title will sort of get them thinking in the right direction as to as to what the, what the message is. And I do think art uh, needs a message. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a really good answer. Um, I asked that because I'm a representational painter and I like the title to also help guide people to consider different things. Um, I think one that really struck me was the last piece on the slide, Woman in Red because yeah. it's a very representational title and well, it's, it's, it's not a woman in red, it's a nude right. in red. Oh, right, nude, <laughs> nude in red yeah. dress. Yes, yes. So how did you come up with the title for that piece? I don't know, maybe it is divine inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, that series started with, uh, with Carmen, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and then Femme Fatale. Mm -hmm. And then uh, finally, I don't know, it just sort of evolved into the nude in a red dress. And uh, the title sells it in some cases. Yeah, yeah. They'll look at that and they'll say, oh, yeah. 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 Well, the, the, you know, we associate red with passion and uh, passion and love yeah, and, uh, and all of that. But the sheen and the, and the form, yeah, the sensuous oh, form, you know, it all, I can... I'd buy one if I was allowed to have any bowls. <laughs>
Any other questions? I think I saw uh, a hand that was up and there are a couple of comments in the chat. That's mm -hmm. right here. The question, Joe, is does, has anyone ever come to you with a request to have a cusp for a bowl? And if they did, or if maybe that's a common experience, I don't know, how would one describe, or how does one describe what they want if somebody were to come to you like on a commission basis? Right. Um, I do a fair number of commissions. In fact, now I think half my work is commissions. Mm -hmm. Well, actually half my work is, is donations to charity auctions. <laughs> uh, but the other half is mostly commissions. And the commissions come from a couple different sources. Very often, it'll be a special tree that, uh, that came down and, uh, and they want a piece out of that tree. And they don't really care a whole lot what it is. Other people want something particular for a wedding present or something. And they will usually have come to me because they've seen something on my website that they like. So they point it out and I can usually either have one or make one that's similar. What they don't realize is that but if we decide on what they want, I have to make it. We're talking about months. Um, yeah, you know, um, yeah I, I had people come to me and say, uh, well, I need a, a, a present for my anniversary present to my husband. And I say, oh, good, good, good. we talk about it. And they say, oh, and by the way, it's next week. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's all, unless I have to have one. But a lot of times people will have an idea as to what they want based upon um, perusing my website. Of course, they usually want something that's totally irreplaceable. Yeah. <laughs> I see Jim Earl waving his hand. I was impressed by what he can do to rotten work to make it into art. And uh, I am, after seeing the red bowl, I'm glad to look at the, when we walk in the door to our house, we see our red bowl, <laughs> which we've had for uh, many years. And uh, I'm glad to see that uh, see what the prices of Red Bulls are doing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we think Joe Dickey is a, a tremendous artist and are glad to have some of his work in our uh, environment. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, I want to remind you that, that with all my pieces, there's a lifetime guarantee. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that it's my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anything happens, anything happens to it, you know, the dog eats it, uh, somebody pours it through the dishwasher or whatever it is. Uh, I've replaced about half a dozen of these over the years for one yeah. silly mistake or another. So anyway, I hope that, Jim, I hope it holds up um, and doesn't mean any disaster. Well, that's good to know. I might be able to use that as uh, some leverage in my quest to have one of your pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there are a number of comments in the chat. Marissa, were any of those questions? One of the questions from Neil is, what is the best finish? Well, the finishes vary depending upon the piece. The, the colored ones, I tend to like a bright finish. And those finishes are a little bit lengthy because um, a piece that's colored brightly like this um, is about eight or seven to nine coats of shellac mm. and that shellac builds up a, a fairly heavy finish so you can sand it mirror smooth and then there's a wipe of varnish on top of that because shellac is a fairly fragile finish with regard to water spotting or things like that whereas the, the wipe of varnish makes it more, more robust um, this by the way was a return because they dropped it and it cracked and uh, they they tried to glue it together and it didn't work, so they gave it back to me and I replaced it. But uh, but anyway, finishes and then, but that's that's the, the colored ones that I like a bright finish on. Uh, it's, if it's natural wood, I tend to like um, more of a matte finish. They're much easier to finish, and that's just a wipe of what's called Danish oil, usually. Um, 
it soaks into the wood, but then you can buff it to whatever sheen you want. Huh. And I'm going to show you the buffing machine that's right here. And you buff it to get whatever. Uh, well, there's three different wheels here with different compounds, but it's you know, at any brightness you want. Um, but that's about it. The only finishes I use are the, uh, the, the finish for the brightly colored ones, which is needed multiple shellac and white for varnish, and the, uh, or the natural ones, which are uh, uh, this. Which is just uh, Danish oil that's buffed. So, just to, so I understand, that has nothing but a coat of of that Danish oil. That's One correct. Coat, and then you po polish it, buff it. Maybe, maybe, maybe two, but but not many. Uh, right. One or two coats of that, um, and it uh, and then it's buffed. And the buffing can bring about any amount of. Shine that you want mm -hmm. for. I think for natural wood, you want a, a nice warm color and a nice warm shine. I saw another question pop up or comment pop up, uh, Marissa. Um, what do we have there in the chat room? Uh, Jan recommended putting a bit of gold leaf on the craft. There's a Japanese technique for it. Um, Somebody uh, just posted what it is. I'm not sure I can. Yeah. 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 Hintsugi. Hintsugi. Gold leaf. Hintsugi. Yeah. Is that gold leaf you said? Yes. Yeah. Um, I've done a little bit. Well, I've done a little bit with gold leaf. It's a pain in the neck, frankly. <laughs> You've got to be good. But I've also done some with uh, the gold um, gilder's paste, it's called. Um, I don't know if that shows or not, but it's a antique gold on the inside of this and just well actually it's redwood on the outside but um, so I've, I've done a little bit with the gilder paste and i've done some with acrylic also Can you see that all right yeah is a uh, acrylic on the inside and just pull that and here's an example of the <clears throat> danish oil buff on the outside it's fairly bright but not real bright and uh I like dealing with these colors. There's a lot you can do with them. That leads me to a, a question that I, I wasn't sure I wanted to ask, um, but you've made me think of it again. Do you see any change taking place in, in what you're doing, a change that might be spurred by new tools or, or you know, new technology? Or, or, uh, I, don't think I don't think they're new. Uh, all the tools and technology has pretty much been around, but uh, using them is new. Uh, I, I do have an airbrush that I've uh, played with, but I haven't really mastered yet. Uh -huh. uh, for shading colors from one color to another, for example. And, mm -hmm. thing. and also I've done a little bit of carving uh, on molds uh, with uh, getting, in some cases, gold inlay but other cases, uh, acrylic colors inside of, of veining kind of lines and whatnot. Yeah. But um, I really haven't done a lot of that. But none of those are new. There's no new technology. Well, new, new to you and it's new to me and new to us and exciting to at least me to know that there's something to look forward to as beautiful as your work has always been, that there might be new things. Uh, for well, us thanks. To see but I, yeah. If somebody starts with a blank piece of paper and makes a piece of art, that's art. I start with wood. People like wood. If I don't mess it up too bad, they still like it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, so I, it's a, as a medium, it's much more forgiving than paper <laughs> or yeah. can. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, no comparison. Well, I don't know. It's still pretty amazing what you're able to do with it. So uh, <laughs> it, it, that you're being very um, modest to say it that way. And, and now I have to say that um, it's about 10 minutes of six. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, regretfully at the start, uh, Joe and Martha and I uh, have someplace that we're supposed to be at six or as soon after as possible. And 
And I have the double excuse. I'm I'm not just a guest. I'm going to take photographs at the request of the organization. So I really do have to cut this a little shorter than usual. But for anybody that didn't get their question answered, if you send a question to info at uh, MFA, I uh, will get back to you. Yeah. Get it to Joe and get an answer and get back to you. So uh, again, Joe, thanks a lot for all you've done for the art community and the beautiful My pleasure. you've created. And, well, thank thank you for all this too, because it's a investment of your time and thank MFA. Uh, they gave me and a, a, a thousand other artists, uh, emerging artists, uh, their start in life. Yeah, yeah. And thanks to Martha for her technical support and thanks to Marissa. Right uh, for hers and thanks to all of you for listening in right. and all right, right thank you all good thank night you. thank you so much everyone you all have a good night